And next is our science and education segment hosted by Barbara Brabitz. Uh, Barbara will be interviewing Dr. Heidi Newberg of RPI. She's an astronomy professor there, and she'll be talking about the universe. So look to the sky and let's watch this one. to the science and education segment on impact. I'm Barbara Bravitz. I am pleased to announce that my guest today is a local who has made it big, Dr. Heidi Newberg. She is a full professor of applied physics and astronomy at RPI. Welcome to the show. Oh, that's nice to be here. It's great. It's great to have you here. Um, your local uh, segment, your, your background is just an added bonus to really <laughs> why you're here. We were talking about living in Schoharie County earlier. But um, your background is impressive. So can you give us just a snippet of wh how you came to be where you are dealing with uh, the phenomena that is the universe, which is a pretty big field if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, a, a lot of my colleagues wanted to be astronomers from when they were very small. They knew this is what they wanted to do. And that actually wasn't how it was for me. Although I did, you know, growing up in Skahari, you look up in the sky, you can see the sky. It's good. A lot of sky. So, uh, so it wasn't, uh, it was a little familiar. But I, I started out um, actually going to RPI for undergraduate school in mechanical engineering because that was, you know, if you like science and math and... You're and you're say, good at it, you're yeah. Say, I, you say, I want to get a job someday, I'll do that. And I switched into physics after my first year. And uh, I think those of us who, who switch into physics, we switch in because we want to know why why, why, why? We're so stuck in that why stage. Just not <laughs> how, which is the <laughs> engineering how, which part. Is the engineering part, right. that's right. But the pure science is the why does it work the way it why. does? Why is that true? And so I really, uh, at heart, I'm a physicist. And um, I went to graduate school uh, in, at Berkeley in physics, but I ended up doing my PhD research on supernovae, using supernovae to try to measure the expansion of the universe. And um, and so when I graduated, I uh, went on to astronomy uh, projects, and so my research is pretty much uh, 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 standard astronomy projects. So I started out doing, uh, looking for supernovae and trying to measure the rate of expansion of the, the universe and uh, doing a lot of um, computational methods on data. And so using co computers to look at data because, uh, you know, we, at that time we were kind of switching over from uh, photography uh, as a data collection for astronomy and CCD cameras. And that, you know, completely opens new doors in how you uh, look at the sky to have everything on computers. And CCD cameras are kind of like digital, what digital That's cameras right. are born from. Yeah, it's the same thing. The CCD same is just a digital camera yeah. taking different pictures in different That's colors right. and interlaying them on top of one another. That's right. So again, as a physicist, the universe is your playground. You're looking at physical phenomena and trying to understand those physical phenomena that happen to be within the Milky Way or in the expansion of the universe. So let's talk about the Milky Way. We're on kind of a boring planet, from what I understand. <laughs> a they're rocky. None of them are boring. Says <laughs> <laughs> the astronomer. <laughs> they're not. They're all interesting. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we are kind of a medium planet and a medium yeah, solar yeah, if system. You, if you put it that way. Yeah, you know, we we wouldn't stand out in the crowd probably. <laughs> Except for us with our color coordinated yeah, colors today. Right. <laughs> so. Nine planets, maybe that's what most suns have, or eight, I'm saying eight and a half, eight, yeah, okay. <laughs> eight point something. <laughs> uh, satellites, moons, a uh, yellow sun, kind of normal, would yeah. you say? Yeah, that would okay. be, you know, I think most, a lot of the stars in the Milky Way are in the disk. So the Milky Way itself, um, the, the most of the light from a, from a spiral galaxy comes from those big spiral arms. People have probably seen pictures of, of uh, spiral galaxies. And so the, those are all the young stars are in those spiral arms. So those are all the stars that are, that are formed in the Milky Way itself. There's hydrogen gas in there and the hydrogen gas compresses and makes stars and you see it and that's what you see in all those spiral arms. And the, the sun is in that population. The sun is a star that was born in the Milky Way. But what 
what we're learning about how galaxies form is that they form from mergers of smaller galaxies. And so over the so age of the whole universe. Smooshing two galaxies together yeah. or collapsing two like a sandwich or spiraling together are all of these the models of galaxy birth that we can look at? So I, this, I'll tell you, yeah, yes, but let me, the way I would look at it is that you have, um, in the very early universe, and this is all, this could change with time. Our picture right now is that in the very early universe, you started with smaller clusters of stars, smaller galaxies. And those smaller galaxies merged with each other. And then those galaxies merged with each other. And there's still some smaller galaxies that would merge in. And then, but the, the average size of the mergers gets bigger as you go on and the, and the galaxies grow over time. So if you look very far away, so you're looking kind of at, at light that came from very long ago, right? It left the galaxy a long, you know, maybe billions of years ago. You look far away, you don't see the big grand spirals like the Milky Way is back then. You see little smaller galaxies that are not as, as large and as well formed. And then over time they merge together. And um, so when, when the galaxies come near each other, um, Everyone always wants to know what happens if another galaxy collides. You know, Andromeda is mid making the news, right? There's going to be a collision of Andromeda and the Milky Way sometime. And, and uh, it distant, distant yeah, future. way distant future. <laughs> You're worried. You're worried about this. What's I'm not happen? popping the popcorn <laughs> yet. No. But um, but when galaxies merge with each other, I mean, stars don't hit each other, right? There's just so much of the galaxy is empty space. Mm. The stars kind of pass through each other, but the gravitational force from the galaxies changes the motions of the stars, right? And so the, so if a, if a galaxy was a spiral and then there was another spiral galaxy and they came and they, they merged with each other, the spiral pattern would be messed up, mm. right? And the stars would go off in whatever new direction that this new galaxy's gravity sent it. Um, but the stars and the planets that are around those stars would, oh, they'd, all they would notice is that the star pattern in the sky changed, but, but, the, but their local uh, solar system would be intact. So the overwhelming force that may be bringing these galaxies together is gravity? That's right. That's so, it? The simple gravity? Well, it, it, Apple falling off the head gravity? Right. Well, you know, the, we usually talk about four forces in physics, right? There's the strong and the weak force, right? But they only act over very small scales. They're only important if you're like atomic distance or your nuclear distances away from each other. Very, very small. And the two forces that act over big distances are gravity and uh, uh, electricity, electricity and magnetism, right? And the thing is, with charges and electricity, we have positive charges, like protons, and we have negative charges, like electrons. And so if you have a lot of them together, they can kind of cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. The forces can cancel. With mass, there's no negative mass. Right. As far so, as we know. As far no. <laughs> yeah, no. Sci-fi. We're going to get sci-fi here. <laughs> no, there's no negative mass. So, um, so if there's a mass, no matter how far you are away, it adds to the forces, right? So the, the, the big force in astronomy, you know, unless you're, you know, nuclear reactions inside a star or something, the big force is all gravity that's acting over big. So that's the big force that um, tells us whether our universe is, you know, it, it, it uh, governs the expansion of the universe and the formation of galaxies and the formation of stars in those galaxies and the motions of planets around the sun uh, is really uh, all that is uh, gravity. It's fascinating because it's such a complex system. Even if you go out on a night, like in Schoharie, you can see the belt of the, of the Milky Way, you can see the cluster of the stars, and it's not evenly patterned. Yet, such a simple force of how one piece of mass attracts to another piece of mass and influences its movement creates that beautiful pattern. But there's more than just the stars that we see out there, and that's really where your research gets down and dirty. <laughs> that's right. It's the dark matter. Right? The dark matter. And, um, you know, one thing I usually point out to, to people, I, I mean, you think about it, someone points it out. I mean, you only see things at all because there's uh, light hits it, right? So 
uh, there's a light in the room or the sun or something is lighting up everything you see and then then the light that's reflected or right you know, comes so to you. white light you is see. hitting your dress right. right now yeah, that's right. and all colors but red are being absorbed that's and right. the red is being reflected out and my eye can perceive that red light those waves hitting yeah. me and so because of that interaction of light and mass mm -hmm. I see you Right. I close my eyes, I don't see you. We turn the lights off, I don't see you. It doesn't mean you're not there. It just means that my mode of seeing you is gone. That's right. So now we have matter. Yeah. We so have light is, matter and dark matter. So, so the matter, all the matter that you've ever seen, if you can see it, that's, that's the regular matter, okay? We would call it baryonic matter. Ooh. <laughs> That's the light, the light matter, the, light the to matter. be seen matter is baryonic. <laughs> the stuff you can see is baryonic. <laughs> big word. That's a big word, that's what we would call it. We call it baryonic matter. Um, now what happens if you have a kind of matter that when the light hits it, it just goes straight through? Then you can't see it because no, no, uh, no light comes back to your eye or to your telescope. Um, and the only way that we know it's there is because of gravity. Oh, that gravity again. <laughs> gravity. Um, and so what happens is things that you can see, like stars or hydrogen gas or things that are made out of baryonic matter, um, they move as if there was a force, an unseen, a force from some unseen mass. And that unseen mass is dark matter. Now, you know, I think most of us, when we first heard there was dark matter out there, really, you know, said, yeah. you know, is there another explanation? Right. <laughs> Can there be something Is there else? an E, none of the above, <laughs> on the test? Because right. when I, I hate to show my age, but when I took <laughs> physics and astronomy back in the day, there was no dark matter or dark energy. The universe was expanding, it would stop expanding, and then there was a contraction period that we were all taught would happen. Mm -hmm. Now what you did in graduate school, along with many of your colleagues, along with Nobel laureates who have since earned the prize for this, <laughs> is you found that it's not going to stop and come back. It's going to keep on going, and not only keep on going, but even go faster. Mm -hmm. How did you find that out? I mean, I, can you kind of put it in a nutshell? What was the big difference? Okay. So first I want to make sure that no one's confused between dark matter and dark energy. Okay. Okay. I might have used them interchangeably. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, we're switching quickly. Okay. All right. So dark matter is this is the the mass, the extra mass that does not interact with light, that's in um, galaxies or galaxy clusters that causes star, stars to move as if there's mass. Dark energy is something that actually we have no idea what it is. Yeah. It's whatever is pushing the universe apart, and. Um, so dark actually, dark matter is non-baryonic matter, if I'm following the term correct. Right. Is there right. another word we use for it? You know, people always think the, the most common form of the dark matter that people, um, people talk about it are wimps. Wimps. Weakly interacting massive particles that, that you know, but um, dark matter is probably the, the thing to use. Okay. Um, so dark energy came about from exactly what you said, which is when I was a, a graduate student, actually the title of my thesis was searching for the deceleration parameter of the universe. That's how much we expected it was slowing down. And what do we mean is, is if this is our universe, this is our universe. That's a balloon, a with, balloon with spiral galaxies on it. see little spiral galaxies I gotta get on me it. one of those balloons. <laughs> I, well, when you're astronomer, you get to carry these around in your purse. <laughs> All right, so if, if the surface of the balloon is the universe and you're a little ant and you right. crawl around on top of that, um, and you, you're crawling around here, and if the universe expands, people get confused when I say the universe expands, right? Because they think, well, you know, where's it expanding into, right? right. Where, where's it expanding into? And if you're thinking about a balloon, the surface got bigger, where did the area come from? It was there already. Yeah, well, it, it kind of came from that third dimension, right? right. Kind of came from that third dimension. And that's how we kind of think about that there may be there's some other dimension that space is coming from. Oh, gosh. Oh, dear. Yeah. And so so if you have galaxies, they move, they're moving away from each other. 
Right, because these were closer together, and now you've blown into the balloon into that massively third dimension, <laughs> and now they're further apart. They're further so we apart. can see the Doppler shift, the movement away of these two galaxies. Mm -hmm. We know that things are moving away from us from where we sit today. Yeah, so we see that the galaxies look like they're moving away, and that the space between the, gal the galaxies is actually getting bigger. Okay. And we all thought, you know, a couple decades ago, <laughs> that... Um, that the gravity from those galaxies mm -hmm. was going to pull it all back together. Just like, you know, if you throw your shoe up in the air, it comes back down, right? And if the universe is expanding out, that gravity is going to pull back and it's going to decelerate. And, um, and so when the data came back from the experiments, and, and how do you do this experiment? What you can do is you can look very far away. And if you look very far away, you're looking at light that came from a long time ago. It left there. So you're kind of looking back in time. You can't look back in time here, but you can look back in time somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hope it's similar to what, <laughs> happened, similar here. To what happened here. Yeah. That's right. Um, so you look very far away, and you measure how much the universe was expanding back then and compare it to how much expanding now. Mm -hmm. and, and what it was, it was astounding that we figured out that, that it it's expanding faster now. So even at within a few millennia of the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe is slower than it is right now on our boring little planet and our boring little solar system in our boring little... A few little millennia is too small a time. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Back a few gazillion years. No, so, you know, the, um, the, the whole story of the expansion, the history of the universe and the expansion, um, you know, we always say that the universe started out at the Big Bang, right, as infinitely dense and infinitely small. But, you know, no one knows what that means. Right. Nobody. Um, but anyway, so it started out like that. And, it, and the universe, you know, expanded out from that. So mm -hmm. space expanded out. Kind of the balloon, which wasn't infinitely tight and infinitely small, but it was small. It was small. Yeah. And now it gets bigger. It gets bigger. And, and, at that, and then very extremely quickly after that, we think that there was a period where it expanded very quickly, exponentially, expanded faster and faster, kind of like it's doing now. Mm. And that was called inflation. So a very short period of time, it, the universe expanded by a large amount, okay? And then we think that it stopped expanding that way, so inflation ended. And when inflation ended, the whole, uh, the whole visible universe, the whole universe that we can see, anywhere direction you look, uh, was about the size of a grapefruit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, so that's very close to the beginning of the, the universe. So let's fast forward to your research billions and billions of years later. Okay. You see that the universe is expanding, and it's expanding faster now than it was in the past, and gravity isn't behaving the way it should. So what is the consequence of this? So, so the, the gravity, we think, is still pulling the universe to decelerate, but something else mm. unknown is pushing it apart. And whatever that is, that's called dark energy. So okay. we're, we're really, I mean, the theorists have got a lot of work to do now. So you've got out what that an attractive force and some kind of opposite force that works on matter the way matter isn't supposed to be worked on. That's right. Wow. <laughs> so how, how, what do you expect will come out of your research and the research of others like you? How, how long can we expect this history to change because it's already changing. Yeah, well, um, little things change all the time. Um, you know, one of the really big discoveries, so I think dark energy as a concept is very new. So dark energy, I think, is going to take a long time for us to figure that out. Um, dark matter, we're closer to. And, um, you know, for some decades, people have been trying to directly detect dark matter. They have experiments in mines where they're looking for very tiny fluctuations uh, in very cold crystals and, and all kinds of other experiments to try to find, find dark matter particles that are, you know, coming through the earth. And so far, no, no success. Uh, I think that a lot of people are really hoping that soon um, we'll have direct detection of, of dark matter. But 
the, the research that, uh, but nobody knows, right? Until we find it, nobody knows. Um, the research that I'm doing is trying to figure out where the dark matter is in the Milky Way. And there's, you know, we have measurements of, you know, rough measurements of how much dark matter there is. And it's, a, you know, maybe four times as much as baryonic matter. It's like a whole lot wow. more dark matter than there is baryonic matter. Um, but, uh, but we're trying to figure out where that is. And there's not even any agreement on whether you know, is it a spherically symmetric shape? Is it squashed towards where the, where the plane of the Milky Way is towards the spiral arms? Is it like a football the other direction? Is it lumpy? Um, and so I, I'm trying to understand that, you know, where is the dark matter? And in fact, um, there are cases where, where I've worked with particle theorists to try to understand whether, if the, if the dark matter is lumpy or if it's in streams, would that affect the direct detection experiments? Oh. Right, so you know, what happens if we don't happen to be in a lump? <laughs> or if you know, the lump comes through us, or how lumpy is this, this, um, uh, this dark matter in the Milky Way? So those are, that's what I'm trying to work out. So if there's a young boy or girl out there watching, <laughs> and they're thinking, why? Why what? <laughs> why? Why do I care? No, no, no. Why, <laughs> why, why do things act the way they do? The answer is oh. we don't necessarily know. Oh, no. There's so much more out there to figure this all out. So they can always contact you at RPI. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, ask we'll, <laughs> I'll ask you the why, and you'll say, come on down, yeah, down get yeah. your PhD, and yeah, then we'll talk. Absolutely. Well, Heidi Newberg, it's been wonderful to have you here. And frankly, you've put more whys in my head than hows today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I want to thank you for being here, and I hope we can have you back sometime. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You've been watching the Science and Education segment on Impact. Thanks for watching. Proctors, bringing the best in arts, education, and entertainment.